On April 15, 1850, Myers, Miller, Newcomb, and Lamoro secretly fished out the bell and packed it in a strong box. They loaded the box onto Newcomb's wagon and headed west. Because Lamoro was a Latter day Saint, they decided to go to Canesville, Iowa, where they joined Shadrach Roundy's independent Salt Lake City bound freight company. While the bell moved west with Roundy, David Lamoro and his family seemed to have joined a church sponsored emigrant company headed by Joseph Young, assisted by William Snow. That party's en route inventory of people and resources lists the Lamoro family with two wagons, nine head of cattle, and six people. Emigrants in the Young Party ferried their 42 wagons across the Missouri River and headed west on June 15th, the smallest of 10 companies that left Canesville, Iowa that year. The first segment of the company entered the Salt Lake Valley on October 1st. Others arrived later. Shadrach Roundy's even smaller freight company, which included a few independent travelers, left for Utah on June 22nd. His people regularly interacted with Young's church-sponsored emigrant train. Eventually, Roundy's company moved out ahead of the emigrants and arrived in Salt Lake City two weeks before them. During the trip, Newcomb's wagon experienced difficulties. One ox died near Laramie, Wyoming, and within a few more days the other ox died, leaving Newcomb without transportation. So, the bell was transferred to Hiram Mott's wagon for the rest of the journey. Mott lost one ox, a cow, and seven horses, one on a hot July 15th, from exhaustion while running buffaloes. David Lamoro lost a large red and white ox and a red steer. Some of the company's cattle died of exhaustion. Others either strayed or were left behind to die on the road west of Fort Bridger. Hiram Mott from Bainbridge, New York, served as the captain of one of three tens, Brigham Young's term for subgroups, in Roundy's company. Roundy was captain over the first ten, which, among others, included his own family and that of David Lamoro. William W. Rust, a Vermont native, was captain of the second ten. As with the Lamoro family, the names of Mott and Rust with their wives and children appear in both Roundy's journal and Young's roster. The names of the three Iowa City men don't appear on either list. Perhaps these old-school Presbyterians maintained their independence by camping separately or moving ahead on their own. Roundy's party arrived in Salt Lake City on September 10, 1850. Eli Myers, James Miller, A.B. Newcomb, and David Lamoro wintered in the city, with the tightly boxed Hummer Bell still in their possession. In early February... Hiram Mott met with Asa Kalkin, who, with his family, had arrived in Salt Lake with the Young Snow 1850 Emigrant Company. Kalkin was working as a clerk in the tithing office. After negotiations, which may have included David Lamoro, the parties agreed on a purchase price of $600. Culkin entered into this agreement while President Brigham Young was away on a trip to southern Utah. Later on, Young's absence would help explain some of the confusion surrounding the Hummer Bell. Years later, Brigham Young assumed that because Hiram Mott negotiated the deal, Mott received the funds. The official record shows distributions to four people from an account set up at the tithing office for David Lamoro. On March 20, 1851, a credit of $600 for one bell was posted in Lamoro's account. From then until mid August, Lamoro authorized payments in kind or cash to three other men. The account book gives no reason for the payments. Most likely, 
they compensated the receipts for expenses incurred in transporting the bell. On April 1st, John Eli Myers received a single payment of $90. His traveling companions, James Miller and A.B. Newcomb, are not among the recipients. On April 9th, Hiram Mott received $15 in cash. On the 18th, he received three bushels of potatoes and 200 pounds of flour at 10 cents per pound. Total value, $25. It was not until August 14th that Shadrach Roundy received $11 and a credit for goods valued at $9 at the Salt Lake Mercantile Store of James A. Livingston and Charles A. Kincaid, located just south of the Council Hall on Main Street. For his part, Lamoral ordered 200 pounds of flour, paid some back tithing, and spent $8 on a stray animal bill. This left just over $200 in his account. All of it was transferred to Samuel P. Hoyt's account on October 9th. The Hoyt family arrived in the Salt Lake Valley late in September 1851 with virtually nothing to live on. Brigham Young was looking for volunteers to help settle Fillmore, the newly designated territorial capital. Hoyt responded to Young's public announcement by signing on. The last of the Hummer Bell funds from Lamoro's account allowed Samuel and his family to outfit themselves for the trip south. It is worth recalling that it was during the winter of 1849 to 1850 that the Nauvoo Bell cracked and was melted down. David Lamoro's party arrived in Salt Lake City four days before the September 14, 1850 report in the Deseret News about plans to enlarge and recast the bell. This timing in Salt Lake City may have contributed to conflicting stories that confuse one bell with another, including the misconception that David, some accounts include his brother Andrew, brought the Nauvoo Bell to Salt Lake in 1848 or later. As noted earlier, the Nauvoo Bell arrived in Salt Lake City on October 2, 1847, with the Charles C. Rich Emigrant Company. Andrew Lamoro traveled to Utah in 1848 in a large company headed by Willard Richards. The confusion over which bell came west, with which emigrant company surfaces most often in accounts influenced by a series of next-generation Lamoro family histories. All of these stories borrow the details of the Hummer Bell incident and apply them to the Nauvoo Bell. The first two of three interrelated Lamoro stories are biographical sketches based in part on an interview with David Lamoro. The first is a short, undated biographical sketch titled The Nauvoo Bell. It was written by one of David Lamoro's daughters sometime after his death in 1905 and before 1943. Besides telling the Hummer story as if it took place in Nauvoo, this account brings the bell from England, changes Presbyterian to Methodist, and hangs the bell on Brigham Young schoolhouse. All of these errors are common elements in Utah accounts. The story of the bell occupies the first third of this biography. Quote, The Nauvoo bell has a romantic story as told to me by my father, David B. Lamoro. The bell was placed on the temple at Nauvoo, was purchased and donated by the members of the English saints and brought to America by Apostle Wilford Woodruff. November 19, 1848, the temple was destroyed. At this time, the Gentiles were persecuting the saints and destroyed everything they could not use, taking the cherished bell and putting it on the Methodist church. It grieved the saints so much, they decided to do something about it. They made their plans to repossess it. One stormy night, the men gathered in secret, 
and without horses pulled the wagon to the church and lowered the bell, pushed and pulled the wagon by hand to the edge of the Mississippi River and carefully concealing it in the water. Andrew Lamoro and his brother David were chosen to bring the bell to Utah with their families, concealing the bell in their wagon with their provision. The families walked so the bell might ride. In the notes we have, it states three dates the bell arrived here, 1848, 1851, 1853. The bell was used on Brigham Young's schoolhouse for many years. Close quote. The second Lamoro story is a close restating of the first. It is a pamphlet-sized life history of David B. Lamoro, written and published by a daughter-in-law in 1946. It says that a Methodist minister, having his eye on it for his own church, removed the bell one night, unobserved by the Mormon leader, Brigham Young, who intended to take it west. David Lamoro and his brother Andrew learned of the bell's removal and invited others to help them retrieve the bell from its new owner. The group accomplished the task during the night and hid the bell in a boggy marsh until it could be loaded into David's wagon before crossing the frozen Mississippi River. This made his load so heavy that members of his family were forced to walk most of the way across the plains. The third version of the Lamoro story is found in a 1957 family publication called Our Grandmother Jane the Pioneer. This variant offers greater precision than the others. It is based on the diary of Jane Mathers Savage. The story begins in the fall of 1846 when Nauvoo was being overrun by vigilantes. A group of Latter-day Saint men became aware of a plot to steal the Nauvoo Bell from the Temple Tower. This group was led by David Lamoro and included a few of his friends. They used face masks to disguise themselves as members of the mob. Then, just as the vandals were lowering the bell from the tower to the ground, Lamoro drove his own wagon underneath the bell, and in a flash the brethren were off. The invaders thought the thieves were part of their own group. In a few minutes, the intruders discovered their mistake, but it was too late. David's group proceeded out of the town and hid the bell in the muddy banks of the Mississippi River. The bell remained hidden until the 26th of September, when it was removed and taken to winter quarters and from there to Salt Lake. Meanwhile, according to records in Iowa, three years after his expulsion from his church, Michael Hummer, now a resident of Keokuk, Iowa, became frustrated over his failed attempts to collect the remainder of the monies owed him by the First Presbyterian Church of Iowa City. Early in 1851, he filed with the district court in Iowa City a bill of complaint against the church. On March 18th, Board President S. H. Hazard and the Board of Trustees responded with two handwritten, seven-page documents. One, a response to Hummer's bill of complaint, reviewed Hummer's role in managing the church finances and objected to his alleged unwillingness to take counsel. For example, he went forward, it said, with plans for a church building more elaborate than the congregation could afford. The second document a cross bill, set forth questions the board wanted Hummer to answer in court. In addition, it argued that Hummer had removed property from the church without board approval. Specifically, it said that Hummer violently and forcibly entered the church and took from the cupola thereof one large bell, owned by the church and worth, as these respondents believe, about $500. The cross bill also classified as stolen the Bibles, pulpit furniture, and other items that Hummer said the board approved for removal. On March 19th, 
Hummer's attorney informed the court that Hummer had been found a monomaniac by a jury in the probate court of Lee County, Iowa. The premise of this decision was that since Michael Hummer was in constant communication with the spirits of another world, he was incompetent to care for matters in this world. The probate court appointed three men as guardians of Hummer's person and belongings. These counter-arguments did not resolve the issues of actions and ownership. Changes in church leadership, financial instability, and other priorities within the church delayed the resolution for two years. One narrative says that in 1855, the court awarded Hummer the $650 promised him. At the same time, Hummer was held responsible for the loss of the bell. The value was charged against his claim, giving him legal ownership, but it reduced the cash payout to $150. Ultimately, the histories say this ruling motivated Hummer to seek out and, if possible, to recover the missing bell. The unsettled issue of Hummer's salary was finally resolved through the dedicated efforts of Reverend John Crozier. Because of a long-time acquaintance, Crozier believed he could negotiate a settlement. Crozier served as a pastor and chairman of the Board of Trustees at First Presbyterian Church from May to August 1853. However, the exchange of ideas took place mostly by mail during September and October. Some of the letters were not getting through because Hummer had moved from Keokuk, Lee County, Iowa, just across the Mississippi from Hamilton, Hancock County, Illinois. In a Dear Brother letter dated September 22nd, Hummer proposed that the two of them meet on the first Tuesday of October at the fall meeting of the Presbytery of Iowa, a gathering of a group of local leaders. My highest regards to Mrs. Crozier and yourself, the letter said in closing, yours in Christian Union, M. Hummer. Crozier arrived in Burlington, Des Moines County, in Iowa's southeast corner on October 5th. He soon learned that Hummer had applied to be reinstated in the church but was refused. The presbytery adjourned earlier that day and Hummer left town. Crozier drove west eight miles to the rural farm town of Middleton, where he found Hummer. They had an interview of several hours. Hummer rejected the highest offer the trustees had authorized Crozier to make, that is, to pay him $500, $400 down, and the other hundred in one year. With no better option, Crozier asked Hummer for a counter-proposal. Hummer offered to settle for $400 in cash, $100 at the end of a year at 10% interest, and all court costs and attorney's fees up to $50. This was an achievable deal. Crozier penned a letter to the Board of Trustees detailing his efforts. Understanding that the trustees would make the final decision, Crozier offered in a postscript a word of advice. Humiliating as I consider the proposition here enclosed, I would nevertheless say accept. Agree with thine adversary quickly. The signed agreement charged the missing bell to Michael Hummer, and its value was deducted from his claim. The bell, Crozier wrote, was certainly his at last, whether it was his at first or not. The Board of Trustees approved a payment of $490. Brigham Young and Hummer's Bell A half-continent away and two years after Hummer received his overdue salary, Brigham Young heard about a bell in the Bishop's storehouse that some said had once hung in a church in Iowa City. He asked Asa Calkin, the tithing clerk who had purchased the bell, to inquire of the Presbyterian church there. Young offered two options. First, 
he would buy the bell for a reasonable price. He did not know that Hummer owned the bell. Second, if they wanted the bell, he would gladly return it for what Calkin had paid for it. Instead of writing directly to the Board of Trustees, Calkin wrote to his brother, Charles Calkin, an Iowa City resident. In his July 31, 1855 letter, Asa shared the history of the Hummer Bell. He said that it had no inscription and that it weighed 745 pounds. This is the first known estimate of the Hummer Bell's weight and the unusual lack of a bellmaker's inscription. Charles inquired of others and was told that its ownership was in question. Among those he contacted was board member Henry Murray, a 39-year-old Irish physician and generous donor to the church. Murray's name was high on the list of subscribers willing to help buy a replacement for Hummer's Bell for the North Presbyterian Church of Iowa City. The First Presbyterian Church had changed its name after some members had pulled out and organized the New School Presbyterian Church, formerly called the First Constitutional Presbyterian Church of Iowa City. Calkin provided Murray a copy of Brigham Young's letter. Calkin told him that because of the indifferent attitude of others he met with, he felt he could be of no service to the trustees. He informed his brother Asa that they did not wish to interfere in the matter, but leave it with their agent at Salt Lake. Though hesitant to get involved with the Bell's ownership at the time, the North Presbyterian Church's Board of Trustees moved forward to finish the church building. The new minister, Silas H. Hazard, collected $500 for Eastern donors, and the board secured a $1,000 loan to help fund the work, which included repairing the bell deck, which had been torn up by some hand of violence. On February 25th, 1850, Hazard preached a sermon of dedication. Church membership had dropped to 20 over Hummer's theological shift. Hazard increased it to 45. Over a period of years, the church was adorned with other furnishings. By the spring of 1850, members had pledged $514 toward the purchase of a bell. Early in 1856, their house of worship was extensively repaired and thoroughly redecorated at an expense of several hundred dollars. But in May, sparks from an adjacent planing mill started fire on the roof. It spread and destroyed the entire church building. The trustees met the next day and appointed Dr. Murray, Dr. Cochran, and H.D. Downey to begin planning for a larger and finer replacement. The congregation turned again to meetings in other churches and public buildings. It was in this context that in 1857, Milton Cochran, president of the Board of Trustees, wrote to Brigham Young concerning the whereabouts of the bell. Cochran told Young the bell belonged to the First North Presbyterian Church in Iowa City. Through correspondence with persons in Salt Lake City, Cochran said he was satisfied that the bell is now in the possession of your people. No record exists of President Young's reply. A year later, church members met for the first time in the basement of their new house of worship. But a national financial panic and relocation of the state capital to Des Moines made it impossible even to pay the pastor's salary. In 1862, a new pastor, Samuel M. Osmond, who would serve a record-setting 17 years, revived interest in fundraising. His dedicated service brought people into the church, and membership reached more than 200 Donations and a major loan peaked in 1868 at $7,700. Osmond dedicated the new church in 1865. 
without a bell. Church leaders launched a fundraising campaign in June 1867 for the purpose of purchasing a first-class church bell for the North Presbyterian Church, B-flat bass clef, or as near that as can be procured. They hoped to install the bell before the spire was enclosed. Apparently, the campaign failed to reach its funding target. Seventeen months later, in November 1868, Osmond wrote to Brigham Young to inquire if the Hummer Bell was in Utah. Young confirmed its presence. The bell had been lying idle ever since it arrived, he said. Reiterating the position he held in 1855, Young offered to part with the bell under the right conditions. If the Presbyterians could prove ownership. In response... Osmond said the trustees would like to receive the bell as soon as possible. He would pay transportation costs, but the congregation could not raise the money to satisfy Young's selling price. As a follow-up, the Board of Trustees published a notice in the New York Tribune in January 1869, stating that Brigham Young would be willing to return the bell to Iowa City if the trustees paid transportation costs. An excited Michael Hummer, now living in Kansas City, Missouri, read the notice enthusiastically. He wrote to Brigham Young declaring that he, not the North Presbyterian Church, was the rightful owner of the bell. Hummer said that he purchased the bell from Andrew McNeely in 1844 in West Troy, New York, and that McNeely's name was cast upon the bell. The company Hummer described as the McNeely Bell Company in West Troy, New York, was actually named the McNeely Bell Foundry of Troy, New York. A common problem of the company at that time was that people mistakenly called it by the name McNeely. Andrew McNeely, the son of immigrants from North Ireland, established the Manili Bell Foundry in 1826 in West Troy, now Watervliet, New York. He had learned his trade at age 15 as an apprentice to Julius Hanks, whose father, Colonel Benjamin Hanks, had created a bronze bell foundry in adjacent Gibbonsville. Shortly after Benjamin Hanks opened the new facility, he transferred the business to his son, Julius Hanks, his younger brother Horatio, and to Andrew Manili. The business moved to Troy, New York in 1825. Andrew Manili continued to produce bells until his death in 1851 at age 49. His sons and their descendants continued the business in two separate companies until 1951. In February 1869, Mrs. M. Wheeler, Michael Hummer's niece, wrote to Brigham Young about the bell. The family had heard rumors that the bell was in Utah. However, she said, her uncle did not accept that explanation as true. Wheeler said she would rather learn that the bell was sunk in the Great Salt Lake than to hear it had gone back to Iowa City. Besides, she added, my poor uncle has had much to contend with. Her sentiments reflect a keen awareness of the impact on Hummer's life of the contest between himself and the church he once headed. Young was prepared with an answer. Soon after his November exchange of letters with the Presbyterian minister Samuel M. Osmond, Young secured details about the bell in correspondence with his former clerk, Asa Kalkin, who is living in St. George, Utah. Kalkin reviewed for Young the problems of discerning the ownership of the bell and told the president what he had paid for the bell. With this information in hand, Young replied to Wheeler's inquiry with a letter addressed directly to Michael Hummer. Young said he would give up the bell to the first properly authorized person who will produce bona fide proof of ownership and authority to receive it, and who will refund the money expended thereon, which is between six and seven hundred dollars. 
Michael Hummer replied to President Young's letter in May 1869 with another query. What proof would he need to claim the bell? Young answered that he needed affidavits certifying ownership from two or more reliable persons whose veracity is not likely to be a subject of question. Young also expected to be reimbursed for his expenses. This was the last correspondence between Brigham Young and Michael Hummer, for Hummer never replied. But the story does not end here. The fundraising campaign launched in 1867 by Samuel Osmond went well enough that the Board of Trustees of the North Presbyterian Church of Iowa City approved the purchase of a bell from the Manili Bell Foundry. The bell arrived in July 1869. The cost was $962.30 plus shipping. In August, the trustees hired a contractor to build the spire. However, the bell failed to satisfy expectations. For some, it was too small. For others, the pitch was not acceptable. So, church members increased their donations to fund an exchange of the new 2,000-pound bell for one at least 1,000 pounds heavier. Instead of a bell turned to B-flat in the bass clef, they ordered an E-flat tone. Three months later, the rejected bell was on its way back to the foundry. In February 1870, Brigham Young received a letter from Charles H. Berryhill, an Iowa City resident. Although not a member of the Presbyterian Church, Berryhill expressed an interest in having the bell restored. Young asked his second counselor, Daniel H. Wells, to respond. Young's expectations had not changed. Barry Hill was to pay for transportation, reimburse the church for its cost in buying the bell, and verify the bell's true ownership. Barry Hill's reply to Wells came quickly. He wanted to know the nature of the claim that President Young holds on it. Furthermore, Barry Hill shared his belief that the Union Pacific Railroad would transport the bell to Iowa without charge for the Iowa Church. Wells did not feel comfortable in proceeding without Young's involvement, and since the president was en route to southern Utah, the matter would just have to wait. But Barry Hill was impatient. He wrote again, this time to Orson Pratt, stating that he needed to know why Brigham Young wanted six to seven hundred dollars for the bell. Barry Hill wrote, It certainly cannot be possible that your church, with its professions of Christianity, can be the possessors and holders of stolen property knowingly. But you will perceive that it looks suspicious in Mr. Wells failing to advise us as to the nature of the claim against the bell. Barry Hill concluded, If we knew that it was a just claim, we might possibly make some arrangement to pay it. Three weeks later, Brigham Young was back in Salt Lake City. The reply he dictated reveals his displeasure with the tone of Barry Hill's letter. Wearying of the seemingly unresolvable situation, President Young once again defended the church's need to be reimbursed for what it had paid, a Mr. Mott of Iowa on his way to California, who offered to sell it for six or seven hundred dollars. We paid him for the bell. Young reassured Barry Hill that the bell was boxed up, safe, and when he last saw it, in good condition. He said, The bell we have never used, and probably never should use it. It is not such a one as we want. Young concluded, I am still writing to let you know all that I can concerning it. And now, if you are disposed to prove the property, pay charges, and take the bell away, I shall be very glad to have you do so. If not, you will do me a great kindness not to trouble me any more about it. For Brigham Young, too much time had been expended on the issue. Charles Berry Hill did not respond, and the matter remained unresolved. The bell would remain in storage in the tithing yard for another 39 years, 
from 1870 to 1909. During those same years, in Iowa, the story of the theft of Hummer's Bell appeared in local histories. A new poetic retelling circulated in religious circles in 1907. But in Utah, the passage of time and the death of those who knew the story of the controversial Hummer Bell eventually created gaps in knowledge of the identity and the location of the Iowa Bell. While Barry Hill's exchange with Brigham Young went nowhere, his neighbor in Iowa City had not given up. The campaign to buy a larger bell, launched by Samuel M. Osmond in September 1869, had taken off. The fund drive reached its goal early in 1872, and the church placed an order with the Manili Foundry. The new, larger bell arrived in March and was installed in a spire reaching skyward 153 feet. No doubt the members of the North Presbyterian Church of Iowa City expected to enjoy the tones of their 2,874-pound E-flat bell for years to come. Unfortunately, on June 20th, 1877, the spire, the bell, and most of the front of the building were torn off by a tornado. The spire was replaced with a short battlement tower with a crenellated finish that reflected the architectural pattern of castle towers. Reports on this change don't mention a bell. The congregation enjoyed this church for more than a century before moving to a new building. The old building and its land were annexed to the University of Iowa campus and preserved for cultural activities. Retelling the Story For a number of years after Brigham Young's death on August 28, 1877, and Michael Hummer's passing two years later in Wyandotte, Kansas, interest in the Hummer Bell waned. The residents of Iowa City were reminded of the story by its presence in local histories published in the late 1880s and early 1890s but its identity among Utah artifact custodians was lost. Perhaps it was the detailed recitation of the whole story in Iowa histories that caused the Reverend John Crozier to reflect on Hummer's experience with his opponents. In a letter to a Presbyterian minister in 1890, Crozier said of Michael Hummer, undoubtedly, his mind became unsettled. He was a man of vigorous intellect and an orator by of ungovernable temper. That Scotch-Irish, Virginia, Kentucky blood, which is but another name for Adam unsanctified, was often too much for him. But in many of the things charged against him, he was more sinned against that sinning. And yet I do believe that had a course of Christian tenderness been taken— it is possible many years of efficient labor might have been wrought by him. In 1911, an Iowa newspaper published Elizabeth Irish's collection of her father's attempt in 1895 to retrieve the Hummer Bell. General Charles W. Irish was an Iowa City engineer and railroad surveyor who had been appointed United States Surveyor General for Nevada by President Cleveland in 1886. Irish was called to Washington in 1893 to head the Bureau of Irrigation and Inquiry. One of his responsibilities was to examine irrigation water resources in the western states. It was while traveling through Utah in 1895 with his daughter Elizabeth that Irish befriended a large number of pioneer Mormons. When Irish told his unnamed Latter-day Saint friends about Hummer's Bell, they asked if he had any means of by which he could identify the bell. Irish told them that he had seen the bell many times, and that the name of the foundry and city were stamped on the bell. By appointment the next day, the men took Charles and Elizabeth 
to an outbuilding in the tithing yard and showed him an old bell which they believed Brigham Young had brought across the plains with him. Elizabeth Irish said the men were all armed with magnifying glasses. Before long, they found the name of the foundry and the city of its creator, which General Irish had told them was imprinted on the bell. Charles Irish wondered what the men knew about the bell's history. Their response melded together the story of three separate bells, the Nauvoo Bell, Brigham Young's Schoolhouse Bell, and the Hummer Bell. According to Elizabeth Irish, they stated it was first used for church purposes and to call the workmen to their work each day. This was the Nauvoo Bell, which no longer existed. Her Latter-day Saint hosts also said that in later years when Brigham Young built a private schoolhouse for his own children, the bell was placed in a cupola on it and was used to call the children to school. These older men were not aware that the schoolhouse bell had its own history. That bell had found a permanent home in the Church History Museum. Elizabeth said the men thought that when the schoolhouse was demolished, the Hummer Bell was retired to the old tithing house and was almost forgotten. Actually, the Iowa City Bell rested in the tithing office from 1851 until its transfer to the Deseret Museum. Elizabeth Irish said the old pioneers gave her father their word of honor, stating that when all the old pioneer Mormons had passed away, the bell, of course, would not be of interest to the younger generation, and that they would consent to have the Hummer Bell sent back to the general or his daughter. This was the Nauvoo Bell, which no longer existed. Some time before Elizabeth published her account of Colonel Irish's visit, she became aware that the old tithing house had been demolished and the Hummer Bell placed in the Mormon historical chamber of that city, where it can now be viewed by interested visitors. She said a Latter-day Saint friend sent her a photograph of the bell in its new location. Her friend reassured her, You may be sure if anyone gets that bell, it will be Miss Elizabeth Irish. General Irish's story, as retold by his daughter in 1911 and reprinted in 1926, contains one element that helps confirm the identity of the Hummer Bell. In 1895, the General's Utah hosts insisted that the bell carried no evidence of its maker's name. Irish convinced them otherwise, using magnifying glasses to reveal what remained of the original inscription. This evidence squares with the report 45 years earlier of tithing clerk Asa Culkin, who told Brigham Young that the inscription had been ground off. In other words, Irish agreed with Culkin's observation that the bell had been defaced. The Hummer Bell had spoken. For those willing to take a closer look, the controversial artifact revealed its maker and place of origin. When President Gordon B. Hinckley authorized an authentic reconstruction of the Nauvoo Temple with a bell in its tower, the Hummer Bell once again underwent a close inspection. In the spring of 2000, three architects working on the temple project measured the bell hanging in the campanile. A draftsman's drawing of their measurements reveals a bell 23 and a half inches tall and 33 inches wide at the bottom. The thickness of the metal is about two and a half inches. The architects also found a hint of an inscription in a filed off area on the bell's side, about 15 inches from the top. The area is about two and a half inches tall and 13 inches long. This discovery supports Irish's observation and Culkin's explanation that someone had filed off the manufacturer's name and place of business, no doubt to hide its origin. This was a common practice when used bells were sold. A charcoal rubbing made of what remained of the inscription lacks clarity. 
yet some have seen telltale letters in the rubbing that suggest the name of bellmaker Manili. The caretakers who told Irish that the Hummer Bell once hung in the steeple of Brigham Young's old schoolhouse were confused, yet their assertion was not the only such claim. In 1876, Salt Lake City's Daily Tribune published an article retelling the Lamoro story. The newspaper's version has Young himself directing Lamoro and others to steal the Nauvoo Bell from a Methodist church, not many miles from Nauvoo, and transport it to Zion. After the bell arrived in Utah, the Tribune says it was kicking about the prophet's premises, where the young Mormon hoodlums amused themselves by ringing it. The article concludes with the common claim that the stolen bell was placed in the steeple of Young's schoolhouse, where it was used, according to the paper, to call Young's children to Sunday school. Another example of the Hummer Bell finding its way to the school tower appeared in a New York Times feature article about legends or fanciful stories connected with church bells in England, Europe, and the United States. This 1899 account is written from a Midwestern perspective and identifies it as a bell now hanging over a private schoolhouse of a Mormon prophet in Salt Lake City. The story does not explain how the bell made its way west. Instead, it tells of the unnamed pastor's disagreement with church officials over his salary and his attempt to remove the bell to resolve the question. The Times article says that it was Presbyterian officials who learned of Hummer's effort and rushed to the rescue of their property. They permitted the bell to be lowered to the ground, but then seized it, loaded it in a wagon, and drove away. Reliable evidence confirms that the Hummer Bell was not used at the Brigham Young schoolhouse. Young himself insisted correctly that the Hummer Bell had never been used for any purpose. Nevertheless, the adobe school built just east of the Beehive House in 1860 did feature a small brass bell. That bell, smaller than the Hummer Bell, and clearly marked, has survived. After 32 years atop the school, the bell was removed in 1902. Mrs. Edwin F. Holmes purchased the building with plans to raise it. She presented the bell to the recently organized Utah Historical Society, where it was photographed. Because the society had no display space, they found a new home for it. The school bell now resides in the Pioneer Memorial Museum of the International Society Daughters of Utah Pioneers, DUP, at the head of Salt Lake's Main Street. In addition to the school bell, the DUP Museum has on permanent display the Brigham Young Farm Bell, a large iron bell made by the G.W. Coffin & Company of Cincinnati, Ohio. The original location of that bell was at Young's 600-acre working dairy and experimental farm. The farm includes barns, fields, pastures, and orchards. It was located near 7th East and 23rd South in Salt Lake City. The 1863 farmhouse was moved in 1975 and became part of This is the Place Heritage Park at 2601 Sunnyside Avenue. A second iron bell made by the Coffin Foundry has also survived. It was hung in 1873 in a new belfry built over the entrance to the West Wing Assembly Rooms of the Salt Lake 14th Ward Meeting House. This bell was removed from the meeting house during a renovation in 1909. Seven years later, in October 1916, the ward gifted the old bell to the Deseret Museum, and Bishop George Q. Morris personally delivered it. This bell, measuring about 20 inches high and with a diameter of 25 inches at its base, 
is preserved by the Church History Museum on West Temple Street. Some reports identify a 500-pound bell that once hung in the dome of the Salt Lake City Hall as the original Nauvoo Bell. However, minutes of Salt Lake City Council meetings convincingly demonstrate that the city purchased their bell and a clock in 1866. The City Hall bell no longer exists. It was stolen in 1910, broken up, and sold to a recycler who reported the theft to police. The friendly hosts who told General Charles Irish that the bell he saw in the tithing yard storage shed would soon be forgotten by the Latter-day Saints were correct. Sixteen years after the general's visit, Walter M. Davis sent an inquiry to Joseph F. Smith. Davis had learned that some Iowa City tourists had seen the historic relic at Salt Lake City in 1895. The tourists were Charles W. and Elizabeth Irish. Davis was informed through a secretary's response that President Smith did not know the whereabouts of the bell. This lack of understanding among a new generation of Latter-day Saints led to another unintentional misidentifications of the Hummer Bell. Two days before the annual Pioneer Day celebration in 1931, the Deseret News published an article titled Church Museum Preserves Relics of Pioneer Days. The article drew attention to an old bell used to assemble the pioneers at times of danger and for special conferences to be held within the walls of the city fort is given a place of honor in the museum. This description accurately describes the way the Nauvoo Bell was used in the Pioneer Fort. Calling it an old bell seems odd, but is easily explained. The LDS Museum on Temple Square used that term itself, a printed form with typed entries identifying the location of exhibits of LDS Museum includes two bells displayed in the basement level. The bells sat alongside a homemade chair with cane seat, Levi Ryder's pioneer rocking chair, the Ramage Press that printed the first edition of the Book of Mormon and the 1850 Deseret News Press. The bells, items number 39 and 40 on the list, are described as one bell, used for 30 years on the 14th Ward schoolhouse, and two, old bell brought to Utah in the early days, used for summoning the people to public assemblies. For a long time, it was the only large bell in Utah. In 1936, a request for information about the Hummer Bell arrived in Salt Lake City. A Des Moines librarian who was doing research on the Hummer Bell inquired of Salt Lake librarian Joanna Sprague as to its whereabouts. According to Sprague, her Des Moines correspondent had learned that in 1910, the Iowa Historical Society had traced the bell to the Mormon Ladies' Relic Chamber. An apparent reference to the Daughters of Utah Pioneers collection displayed in the Templeton Building. Sprague questioned the Daughters of Utah Pioneers. The Church Historian's Office and the LDS Bureau of Information but of course found no such bell identified by that name. The Deseret News then invited readers to share with Sprague anything they might know about the bell's whereabouts. An event in the late 1930s became the defining point in tying together the stories of the Nauvoo and Iowa City bells. On June 17, 1939, the Deseret News published an article headlined Haunting tone of Nauvoo Temple Bell rings out anew. The article states that about a month earlier, Joseph J. Cannon, president of the Temple Square Mission, had rediscovered the Nauvoo Bell in a basement corner of the Bureau of Information on Temple Square, where it had rested for years. The article said that Cannon had a rough-hewn redwood scaffolding made for the bell, on which the 1,500-pound bell was hung. 
the poundage of the spell is influenced by knowledge of Brigham Young's suggestion to Willard Richards that an English bell of around 2,000 pounds would be appropriate. Asa Calkins estimated that the Hummer Bell weighed 745 pounds. The Salt Lake City Scales certified the weight on July 20, 2000, as 782 pounds. One can sense in the newspaper statement the passion that still surrounded the Nauvoo Bell. The Nauvoo Temple Bell will ring again, although not a stone of the million-dollar temple erected by hardy Mormon pioneers now remains at the original site on a hill above Nauvoo, Illinois. The Great Bell, which was pulled down in 1850 when the temple was destroyed, is now heard daily by hundreds of tourists visiting Salt Lake. In a detailed retelling of the Lamoral version of the Nauvoo Bell's history, Cannon said that the bell was brought from seclusion and hung in a redwood belfry in the Temple Square Museum. Cannon did not narrate this story on his own. In the July 1939 message, he said Elder Nephi L. Morris, upon seeing the bell and hearing its tone, began looking up information. That same year, Morris published The Restoration, a faith-promoting history of the early days of the church. Cannon quoted the material that Morris found. The extracts quoted included Brigham Young's invitation to the English saints to fund a bell, Young's directive to the agent in Nauvoo to transport the bell to winter quarters, and David Lamoro's rescue of the bell from lawless persons who had hoisted the bell and were making ready to steal it. Although the general story is not useful, the Deseret News article is helpful when it tells us that the bell was brought from seclusion and hung in a redwood belfry in the Temple Square Museum some months before July 1939. Museum records confirm that the bell was moved from the basement to the main floor, where it was not only displayed in a redwood scaffolding, but also featured a new label. No longer was it seen as an old bell. The unnamed artifact now became the Nauvoo Temple Bell. The label asserts that this bell hung in the belfry of the Nauvoo Temple. Following a few comments about the temple construction, the label concludes, After the Latter-day Saints were driven out, the beautiful building was ruthlessly destroyed by the mob. The bell is all we have left of this edifice. The unintentional renaming of the Hummer Bell in 1939 caught the attention of the Church's General Relief Society presidency. For nearly a year, the presidency had been developing plans to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the women's organization. In October 1939, they discussed their proposal with the First Presidency, the presiding bishopric, and Joseph J. Cannon, president of the Temple Square Mission. During this meeting, President Cannon recalled that Brigham Young had suggested building a tower with a bell on Temple Square since the new tabernacle was under construction and new landscaping plans were being created. Cannon's idea was immediately appealing. The Relief Society had been founded in Nauvoo. Placing a bell from that place and time seemed a wonderful way to celebrate a bell tower that would fulfill President Young's desire. Everyone agreed. They would reintroduce the newly rediscovered Nauvoo Bell to the public at that celebration event. The January 1942 issue of the Relief Society magazine celebrated the potential of a monument with a message. The article described how David Lamoro and others rescued the Nauvoo Temple Bell from those who were trying to steal it in September 1846 by driving a wagon beneath the bell and driving off with it. Subsequently, architect Lorenzo S. Young made a model of the campanile, the bell tower, that would house the Nauvoo Bell. But plans stalled. World War II tormented the nations of the earth, and the church was not immune. 
the first presidency postponed the project. Not until 1965 did they readdress the issue and authorize construction. The bell finally went on public display in September 1966. At that time, Relief Society President Bell S. Spafford was advised not to claim that the bell in the Campanile had been rung in Nauvoo. The Nauvoo bell was melted down, so the historians tell me, almost immediately after it was brought to the valley. Mark E. Peterson of the Council of the Twelve informed her, and this bell was created here in Utah. It is called the Nauvoo Bell because I believe the materials from the Nauvoo Bell went into it. In the interim from 1939, when plans were first proposed to display the bell on Temple Square, until the bell was actually put in place, the surrogate Nauvoo Bell was not idle. In 1944, with First Presidency approval, the bell made a special appearance in the University of Utah Stadium as part of the Days of 47 Queen Coronation Pageant. In its announcement of the program, the Salt Lake Tribune offered a brief history of the bell, drawn in part from versions of the Lamoro family's accounts. The program included a tribute to Utah pioneers by Salt Lake City Mayor Earl J. Glade followed by a reenactment of the 1849 days of 47 celebration and the ringing of the Nauvoo Bell. Despite this apparent linking of the original Nauvoo Bell with the 1849 commemoration, the article asserted that as part of the coronation ceremony, the famous bell would make its first appearance at a general celebration in Utah. The confusion over the identities of the two bells publicized to a wide audience in 1939, continued for nearly 60 years. An early example took place in November 1941, when the Deseret News received an inquiry from J. Kirkwood Craig, a minister at the Franklin Methodist Church in Franklin, New Hampshire. Craig had visited Salt Lake City and toured Temple Square. He had also visited Joseph Smith's birthplace. Craig was looking for an article he had seen earlier in the Deseret News. He asked for a copy of and for information on any other historic bell in the area. The newspaper referred the letter to Temple Square. John H. Taylor, president of the Temple Square Mission and Bureau of Information, responded by informing Craig that he had forwarded the letter to the historian's office. Taylor added, Of course, if you were in Salt Lake City, you saw the bell that we have in the Bureau of Information, which came from the top of the temple at Nauvoo. Librarian Alvin F. Smith responded for the office of the church historian. We have not been able to locate the article referred to in your letter, he wrote, and know only two bells in Salt Lake City, which are of historic interest, namely the Nauvoo Temple Bell, which is in the Bureau of Information on the Temple Grounds, and the Bell of President Brigham Young Schoolhouse, which is preserved in the state capitol in the Daughters of Utah Pioneers Collection. By instructions from President Brigham Young, the Temple Bell was sent to Council Bluffs and later transferred to Salt Lake City. The tone of the bell has excellent resonance at the present time. When Craig received these letters, he forwarded them to Jacob Van Dersey, a Presbyterian minister and historian in Iowa City. Craig had already shared information about a grandfather, an elder in the Iowa City Presbyterian Church. Any material Craig got from Salt Lake, he promised to give Van Dersey, but he was disappointed with the lack of information in the letters. I think the man who is at the head of the Presbyterian School in Salt Lake could get for you some additional information. Another example of the confused understanding, this one from late in the century, appeared in 1981 in the church's official magazine, The Enzyme, in the format of an I Have a Question feature. The answer drew heavily from a short document mentioned earlier, The Nauvoo Bell 
written by one of David B. Lamoro's daughters. Unfortunately, the use of this reminiscent account in a church magazine negatively impacted many retellings of the story in subsequent years. To complete her story, the author of the Enzyme article borrowed details for the real Nauvoo Bell's trip west in the Charles C. Rich Emigrant Company. On their way to Utah, the article says the Lamoro brothers rang the bell to awaken the herdsmen at dawn, to signal morning prayer, to start the day's march, and to sound during the night watches to let the Indians know that the sentry was at his post. Not only has the confused identity of the two bells continued in Latter-day Saint circles, but questions about the Hummer Bell's disappearance still surface in southeastern Iowa. For example, in 1998, the Church Historical Department received an inquiry about the Hummer Bell from Iowa City. In part, the letter reads, if the bell does still exist and whoever owns it, and if they would be willing to part with it, we would be willing to negotiate and would be more than willing to come and get it or pay to have it shipped. At that point, corrective efforts were underway inside the historical department. One year later, archivist Ronald G. Watt published his account of the Hummer Bell, which is the starting point for the expanded and revised narrative in the second section of this article. As of this writing, the Hummer Bell, accepted by many since 1939 as the original Nauvoo Temple Bell, remains on display in its commemorative campanile near the tabernacle on Temple Square. Each hour it sounds a single chime, controlled by an electronic system in the basement of the tabernacle set according to Greenwich time. For many years, church-owned media outlets popularized the bell ringing. Beginning on Sunday, July 23, 1961, KSL Radio and KSL TV launched the use of the Temple Square bell to sound the time on the Salt Lake City stations every hour on the hour. The official beginning came as the climax of a special television program that evening, when church president David O. McKay pulled the clapper against the bell's resonant shell. The chime is activated by a signal from the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., that is picked up by a microphone and transmitted to the broadcast studio through a cable. The traditional hourly clang of the Nauvoo Bell ended temporarily in June 2005 when the station converted to a digital or high-definition signal. It resumed a month later after engineers found a way to deal with the seven-second delay in high definition. After the Church History Department shared information about the Bell's true identity with station management, the broadcast company quietly dropped the name from its chiming announcement of the hour. These internal changes were made without public notice. Therefore, media reports of the 2002 dedication of the rebuilt Nauvoo Temple either continued to identify the Temple Square Bell as the original Nauvoo Temple Bell or hedged. A Deseret News piece alluded to the Lamoro version, some say the Nauvoo Bell was salvaged by fleeing church members in 1846 and hauled to Utah a year later, although no one knows for sure. Understandably, misunderstanding or uncertainty continues to the present, making our offering a needed corrective. About the author. Shannon M. Tracy has worked in the IT world for over 32 years and is currently an independent contractor. He enjoys participating in historical research. Glenn M. Leonard served as director of the Museum of Church History and Art, now Church History Museum, from 1979 to 2007. Ronald G. Watt, now retired, was senior archivist at the Church History Library. We acknowledge the contributions of Grant Ellen Anderson, W. Randall Dixon, Rebecca K. Hyatt, and Darlene Hutchinson, who shared with us their research files on the Nauvoo and Hummer Bells. This is an audio production of BYU Studies, 
read for you by Taft M. Robinson and Clara Wright. BYU Studies publishes scholarship informed by the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. For more information and access to articles, essays, and more, visit byustudies.byu.edu.